Bibles, you can turn to uh, Luke chapter 2, Luke chapter 2, and I will meet you there in uh, just a minute. Um, so I don't know about you all, but one of the places where my sanctification is lagging is uh, when it comes to the fruit of the Spirit known as patience. Uh, I, it's always good to begin a sermon with a little bit of confession. So I confess to you, brothers and sisters, I am not a very patient person. Uh, I was reminded of this last night when my wife's uh, car battery died at Kroger during a sporting event uh, that I had intended to watch in the last 30 seconds of the Kentucky game. And then I accidentally took the wrong exit on our way uh, to get dinner, and all of a sudden, I was flooded with feelings of irritability and impatience, followed shortly by conviction from the Holy Spirit. I don't like to wait or for my plans to be disrupted. Now, there's, a, there's very few people I know who like to wait, but what is interesting is I think many of us think that we are more patient than we actually are. We think we will respond to a disruption in our plans or a delay in a particular way, and then there's a backup on I-65. And all of a sudden, the world, the flesh, and the devil are unleashed in our, our car. Uh, there, was a, there was a survey done of Nash, in 2015, so a little bit ago now, of Nashvillians asking questions about their patience in various scenarios. And interestingly, 78% uh, of Nashvillians rated themselves as very or somewhat patient. And I would say that anybody who has driven here for half a second knows that's not true. Uh, there were a couple of funny things on there. 76% drive faster than the speed limit regularly to get to their destination. 56% honked at a driver in front of them at a traffic light that has turned green, which coincidentally I did twice last week, right here on Douglas, because people were on their phone. You gotta be off your phones, people. That's bad. 60, 62% push an elevator button multiple times to get the door to close rather than waiting for it to close on its own. Six, another 62% wait less than a minute before hanging up after being on hold. There is nothing I hate more than being on hold. And I don't know if anybody's ever waited less than a minute for anything on hold before. 67% said they frequently burn their mouths on hot food or beverages rather than waiting for it to cool down because you can't let the, the coffee get cold. Uh, so this morning, we are beginning our Advent series as we make our way to the celebration of Christmas and the birth of Christ. And I share this morning about our impatience because traditionally, one of the central themes of this season throughout church history has been waiting. For those who are not familiar uh, with the word Advent or maybe you're new to the Christian faith, the word Advent comes from the Latin word Adventus, and it simply means arrival or coming. And as you might guess, it's a season where we focus on the arrival of Christ in Bethlehem some 2,000 years ago in order to empower our waiting, our expectation of his coming again. Advent has historically been just as much about the second coming of Christ as it was his first, and central to this season is that feeling of expectation, of longing for something to happen. Waiting was in the air at the time of the birth of Christ. The people of Israel had lived through nearly 400 years of prophetic silence. The Hebrew scriptures, what we call the Old Testament, was being shaped into its final form. And there was a sense that God had written a story without a proper ending. Once again, the Jews were living under the thumb of a, uh, of a pagan oppress oppressor like Babylon, Assyria, the Persians, this time the Romans, who were stronger and more prosperous than any before. And there was this deep longing, this expectation among some of the most devout Jews that God was going to do something new. They had passages like this one in Isaiah 52 in their hearts and minds. Listen, your watchmen, lift up their voices. Together they shout for joy. When the Lord returns to Zion, they will see it with their own eyes. Burst into songs of joy together, you ruins of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord will lay bare his holy arm in the sight of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. There was a clear expectation that God was going to personally redeem Jerusalem. The Lord would return and bring salvation which to most Jews meant freedom from Roman occupation and the restoration of a proper kingdom to Israel like in the time of David and Solomon. That's what many of the Jews were waiting for. That was their hope. 
And this is the uh, first Advent theme that we want to look at together, hope, hope. Now, we just need to recognize that when we are talking about hope, we're talking about something that strikes a lot of people in our cultural moment uh, as fantasy. I could read you more statistics than you want to hear, but basically, since the pandemic in 2020, almost any metric you find of American mental health and reported feelings of hopelessness has seen a dramatic increase over the last three years. And I think most tragically, among young people, teenagers and young adults, have these astronomically high feelings of hopelessness. Now, there are many explanations that have been offered for that, and I could give you my thoughts about it, but I, want, I don't want to spend that much time there today. I just want to acknowledge that when we begin speaking about the Christmas of hope, joy, peace, and love, we can, one, very quickly sound like hippies, and two, we can sound like we're, we're putting our heads in the sand and simply ignoring the darkness that's around us in the world. And what I want to do is offer a different way. Because what I believe is that Christian hope is not simply well-wishing about the future or trying to conjure up positive feelings when you're dealing with difficulty or ignoring all the horrible things that happen in your life or in the world. That's not hope. Christian hope is not primarily about emotions, but it's about a person and a promise. I like this uh, simple definition of hope from John Mark Comer. He says that hope is the expectation of coming good based on the person and promises of God. So there are two aspects to that definition of hope. We have the outcome and the object. The outcome is ultimately in the future. For those of us who are in Christ, we have an expectation and assurance of coming good. No matter how much suffering we experience, no matter how often we are disappointed, there is a hope, there is a future good that cannot be taken from us. Or as Paul said, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. This is a constant theme in the New Testament that no matter what suffering we endure, there is, as in 2 Corinthians, Paul says, an eternal weight of glory that far outweighs all of them. And listen, That does not diminish or dismiss feelings of disappointment or pain. Too often in the church, and I think particularly around Christmas time, we can dismiss people's pain. We can, you know, talk a lot about joy and hope and love, and there's people who are dealing with pain and disappointment. The reality of Christian hope does not diminish those feelings, but I think it assigns them meaning. It assigns them meaning, and that is something that secular humanism or atheism or agnosticism or any worldview that denies an intelligent creator cannot do. Um, Yuval Harari is probably the most well-known atheist of our day. And uh, he wrote this best-selling book, Sapiens, where he basically admits this. And here's, here's what he says. He says, as far as we can tell from a purely scientific viewpoint, and I would say from his purely scientific viewpoint, human life has absolutely no meaning. Humans are the outcome of blind evolutionary processes that operate without goal or purpose. Our actions are not part of some divine cosmic plan, and if planet Earth were to blow up tomorrow morning, the universe would probably keep going about its business as usual. As far as we can tell at this point, human subjectivity would not be missed. Hence, any meaning that people inscribe to their lives is just a delusion. He's not very cheery, but at least he's intellectually honest because he understands that a worldview that denies an intelligent creator cannot account for meaning or purpose. And therefore, in his worldview, all suffering is ultimately meaningless and thus I would say hopeless. But what the New Testament teaches and what most of us grasp is we cannot live without hope. We cannot live without hope. As Martin Luther said, everything that is done in the world is done by hope. Everything that is done in the world, everything is done by hope. We make our holiday travel plans according to hope. We put away money in a savings account according to hope. We wait for our dinner at the restaurant according to hope. We walk through depression according to hope. We go through cancer treatments according to hope. We cannot live without it. And the promise of the New Testament is that in Christ there is a coming good that no matter what we are currently facing, either in this life or the life to come, we will experience it. And so um, 
This morning, I want to walk through a somewhat lesser known story in the Christmas narratives. Rather than starting with the events leading up to the birth of Jesus, I want to draw your attention to Luke chapter 2, verse 25, as we find Joseph and Mary bringing their now one-month-old son, Jesus, to the temple to be consecrated as their firstborn. The law of Moses commanded that there was to be an offering made for every firstborn male, and this was standard procedure. Mary and Joseph, they make their, their way to Jerusalem to offer a pair of doves and two young pigeons, which is what the offering commanded for those who couldn't afford to bring a lamb. And in the temple, they encounter this man. His name's Simeon. And he said he's righteous and devout, and he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. The word there for waiting can also be translated looking forward to or hoping. This phrase, the consolation of Israel or the comfort of Israel, is a phrase that comes from several passages in the book of Isaiah that talk about the coming of the Messiah as a comfort for the people of Israel. Back in that passage, Isaiah 52, 9, burst into songs of joy together, you ruins of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted his people. He's consoled them. Or Isaiah 51, 3, the Lord will surely comfort Zion and will look with compassion on all her ruins. He will make her deserts like Eden, her wastelands like the garden of the Lord. Simeon was clearly a man who had spent many years reflecting on these words and on the character of God who authored them. And he was hoping for, he was looking forward to the coming of the Comforter. And so um, with the time we have left, I just want to work through this passage and I want to give you three observations about Christian hope, okay? Three observations about Christian hope in contrast to well-wishing about the future or simply positive emotions. So that's what we're going to do. Y'all ready? You with me? Okay, Luke 2, 25 through 27. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts when the parents brought in the child to Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required. Okay, first observation is this. Christian hope begins with the revelation of truth. You might notice there's something repeated in these three verses that's prominent in the Gospel of Luke. It's the Holy Spirit. We're told that the Holy Spirit was on Simeon and that he received a revelation from the Spirit about the coming of the Messiah. This is a distinct feature of Luke's gospel, who of course also authored the book of Acts, which is very uh, focused on the work of the Spirit. Simeon, believe it or not, is already the fourth person in Luke's gospel to have received a special revelation of the Holy Spirit. Zechariah and Elizabeth were told that their son, John the Baptist, would be filled with the Spirit. Mary is told by the angel, Luke 1, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Elizabeth, when she encounters Mary bearing Jesus in her womb, we're told she's filled with the Holy Spirit when she cries out in a loud voice, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. Zechariah is filled with the Holy Spirit before he gives a prophecy over his son. Over and over again, the pattern in the book of Luke is the Holy Spirit gives a revelation to people about what God is about to accomplish about the hope that is coming through this child. And here is Simeon. He's next in line when he's given by the Spirit a revelation of an encounter with the Messiah that is to come. And this is important to remember. One of the primary functions of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer is to reveal truth. To reveal truth. John 16, 13, Jesus is teaching on the Spirit. When the Spirit of what comes? The Spirit of truth comes. He will guide you into all truth. Or the Apostle Paul writing in 1 Corinthians about the mystery of the cross of Jesus to the world. Uh, To the world it's foolishness, but he says um, to us it's the wisdom of God. He says, now we declare God's wisdom a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. Listen, these are the things God has revealed to us by his spirit. The spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. The Holy Spirit 
is the means by which God enlightens our minds and stirs our hearts towards the realities hidden in Scripture and what Paul calls the deep things of God. And the reason this matters and the reason this is relevant to Christian hope is because you cannot hope in what you do not know. You cannot hope in what you do not know. See, friends, hope in the abstract as a nice sentiment or an emotion will not sustain you in suffering. As Christmas has uh, secularized in America, we've seen a continuing of the celebration of hope, joy, peace, and love, but abstracted from their source. So then you have, you know, a Hallmark card that says wishing people hope, joy, and love, but really it's just sentimentality. It's I want you to feel these positive emotions during this season. And that's not a bad thing, but that's not what Advent is about. Advent is about God becoming hope for us. It's about the revelation of a hope that we could not create for ourselves. As the song, uh, the song we often sing, I love this song, it says, hope has a name. Hope is a person. Advent is not about conjuring up our own feelings of hope or ignoring the darkness that often drives us towards hopelessness. It's about fixing our eyes and our hearts on the living hope that God has revealed to us in the person of Jesus. That hope was revealed to Simeon, and it continues to be revealed to us today. Let's keep reading. Verse 28, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The next observation is this. Christian hope changes our vision. Christian hope changes our vision. He takes Jesus into his arms, and he speaks this beautiful song of praise over him, this poem that he has seen with his own eyes, the salvation of not only Israel, but of the Gentiles. Somehow, Simeon had been given divine insight and understood Jesus was coming not only to be the Messiah of Israel, but also to all nations. Notice all the language around sight and vision. My eyes have seen your salvation. It's been prepared in the sight of all nations. He calls Jesus a light of revelation to the Gentiles. Light, of course, is what makes vision even possible. I was thinking about all of the busyness of the temple courts that day. How many people must have brushed past Mary and Joseph and Jesus that day? All of them making their own arrangements for offerings and sacrifices. All of them living out their lives. And only two people... Only two people recognized who Jesus was. That's Simeon and Anna, the woman whose interaction comes right after our passage today. Jesus, um, Jesus had a lot to say about sight and vision during his ministry. One of Jesus' condemnation of the Pharisees was that they were blind guides, meaning they attempted to lead others without proper spiritual vision. Or Jesus, using the words of Isaiah, he spoke this to the crowd of Pharisees who heard his parables. He said, in them, Matthew 13, in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's hearts has become callous. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and I would heal them. Friends, there is a type of spiritual vision of sight that Jesus wants his followers to develop. A type of vision that sees the work of God in his kingdom when others are simply passing by. Anna and Sibion, they had two things in common. First, they were both devoted to God. We're told that Anna was fasting and praying in the temple night and day waiting for the Messiah. They were both, the second, they were both waiting for, they were hoping for God to fulfill his promise to Israel. In other words, their hope changed their vision. Hope along with the Spirit caused them to see what other people did not see. And if we are following Jesus faithfully, and I've said this before, we ought to be some of the most counterculturally, almost rebelliously hopeful people because this Christmas season, we see something in the birth of Jesus Christ that the world does not. For most people, the birth of Jesus is a historical curiosity. 
that has, you know, it's sparked an interesting but strange religion, and they're happy that it gives them a few days off work and Santa comes to town. But for those of us who, as Paul says, have had the eyes of our hearts enlightened, there is something so beautiful, so mysterious, so hopeful about what was lying in that manger some 2,000 years ago, the hope of Emmanuel, God with us. And whether the world recognizes it or not, nothing is the same. And we, have, listen, we have to fight for that hope. We have to fight for that hope because the world, your flesh and the enemy will do everything to strip you of it. I have a, a picture I want to show you all. Last week, I pulled into my driveway. Um, I have a picture, I, I think, of a flower bush. You can put it up there. Is it up there? Oh, it's up there, but it's not back there. Last week, I pulled into my driveway, and I was thinking about this sermon and I noticed this flower bush that kind of surrounds the gutters in our house. I know it's not very pretty. Uh, and I think the Spirit kind of drew my attention to it. And I, I noticed that the plant was dying or going dormant. This is the time of year where everything starts to look dark and sad outside, which is why we put up Christmas lights. And all the petals had fallen off. But you see down at the bottom, hanging there, is one little flower. You all see it? See one little flower. And I sort of sat there for a minute looking at it and thinking to myself, thinking to myself, man, isn't this just what it feels like to have hope sometimes? Like everywhere you look, it just feels like darkness and sadness. You hear of a family member with a tough diagnosis. You turn on the news and there's images and stories of the brutality of war and the innocent lives caught in the middle of it. You go to look in the bank account and the money's running low and the bills are coming due and you're not sure if you're going to be able to get gifts for your family this year you're just not sure and sometimes things just feel hard feel dark and hope doesn't come easy and against the backdrop of all that pain and darkness comes into the world this little flower little flower of hope that the coming of christ his death and resurrection is going to somehow undo every evil and all darkness will be cast out and every tear will be wiped away and i think the battle for us in following Jesus is to constantly direct our attention and our hope back toward that truth because that hope helps us to see things that other people don't see. It helps us to see the kingdom of God in somebody's simple act of service and kindness. It helps us to see an opportunity for ministry in an unexpected place. That hope helps us to see beauty and goodness in places and situations that people wouldn't traditionally call beautiful or good. Scott Erickson, um, his book, honest advent he puts it this way he says the giver of life hides revelation in the things we ignore because it is the work of humbling ourselves and asking to have eyes to see and ears to hear that truly transforms our hearts perhaps that can be a simple prayer for you this advent god give me eyes to see Give me eyes to see where you are working give me vision to recognize places of hope in the midst of darkness. Hope changed the vision of Simeon and Anna, and it can do the same for us. Which brings us to the last observation, Luke 2, 33. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about them. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. It brings us to the last point that Christian hope comes through suffering. Christian hope comes through suffering. Simeon speaks this final blessing and word of prophecy over Mary, and unfortunately, the salvation and hope that has come into the world will not come without a cost. Though this infant is the hope of Israel and of the nations, that hope will not come without rejection. Simeon says the child will cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, which is once again an allusion to a prophecy in Isaiah, Isaiah 8. He will be a holy place for both Israel and Judah. He will be a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And for the people of Jerusalem, he will be a trap and a snare. See, the prophets knew that when the Messiah came, there would be a variety of reactions to his coming. Jesus knew 
and consistently taught that he would produce a polarizing response. Think about the parable of the sower, right? We've got the seed falling on rocky ground or in good soil or the parable of the vineyard owner. Jesus lived expecting to face rejection. For those who had eyes to see, like Simeon and Anna, Jesus was salvation. But for those whose hearts were calloused into their own ways of thinking, their own ideas about how the Messiah should reign, Jesus was a threat and a blasphemer. His very presence in words, in the words of Simeon, revealed the thoughts of their hearts. Simeon's prophecy ends with this haunting line to Mary that a sword will pierce your own soul too. Most uh, commentators take this word to mean that the opposition Jesus will face will become so severe it ultimately will end in his death. And of course, his mother Mary will have to stand by and watch her son be crucified and endure the piercing sting of watching her child die. And here is the first hint in Luke's gospel of the surprising twist that is to come, and that is, it's not in spite of his suffering that Jesus is the Messiah. It's precisely because of his suffering that he is the Messiah. Luke chapter 9, Jesus said, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter in his sermon at Pentecost, proclaimed to the Israelites, this man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. And while I know the cross of Jesus is very familiar to us, I do think it's important to stop and reflect on how profound this is. Christian hope only comes through suffering. We could could spend a lot of time thinking about the meaning of the cross and how it dealt with human sin, but, but rather than doing that, I just want to make the somewhat obvious observation that in God's providence, he determined that hope would come to the world not by merely alleviating our suffering, but by entering into it with us. The incarnation, what we celebrate at Christmas, is God taking on human flesh and voluntarily entering the weakness and frailty and suffering of our human life, not so that it can be escaped, but so that it can be redeemed. Kelly Capick, in his book, Embodied Hope, it's a beautiful book on um, pain and suffering, and he writes this about, which is kind of a weird thing to say, a beautiful book about pain and suffering, but it is. He says, God can't taste dust get sick or become hungry, nor can God die. Such events only apply to creatures that have bodies. Out of his love, the Father sent his Son in the Spirit to take on genuine flesh, to become fully human. Only in this way can the eternal Lord, the God who cannot die, enter the reality of suffering and death. Only in this way can the God of light face the darkness of the devil. Only as incarnate can God enter the pen of the grave in order to fill it with life. If there is no Christmas, there is no cross. And if there is no cross, there is no hope. Or as um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German theologian and resistor of Hitler's regime, he was awaiting his execution in his prison cell, and he wrote this in a letter. He said, only the suffering God can help. Only the suffering God can help. And so uh, this morning, as we close, I just want to extend a comfort to you. Because if you are here this morning and this Christmas, things don't seem very hopeful to you. Maybe hope is something you want to have or to feel. You'd like to feel hopeful, but if you're honest, it's like searching for a single flower on a dying plant. Maybe you're in the midst of some sort of suffering right now, whether it's mental, emotional, physical, circumstantial, whatever it is, and you're wondering, is the hope of Christmas for this, for this trauma, for this pain, this disappointment, is the hope of Christmas for that? Or do I just have to conjure up my own feelings of hopefulness and, you know, have a holly jolly Christmas? Let me encourage you with this this morning from these, uh, these words from Hebrews 2. For this reason... He had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. 
See, whatever you are walking through right now, your hope is not necessarily that it will disappear or that it will somehow be used for your ultimate good. Your hope is that there is a person who is with you in it. And ultimately, whether in this life or in the next, its sting will be removed. We have an assurance of a coming good in Christ. The body of Jesus and the soul of Mary was pierced so that the sting of our sin and our suffering might one day be relieved. So I'd invite uh, Micah and the worship team, if you all make your way up. And, you know, there are a lot of things that can be taken from us. There are a lot of things that can be taken from us in life. But those who have remained most faithful to Jesus in moments of suffering realized that they had a hope that cannot be taken. A hope that is, as it, as it says in Hebrews, a hope that is an anchor for our souls. So uh, as we respond, I invite you, go, with, go to him with your pain. Go to him with your pain, your disappointment, and ask him that if he will not relieve it, at least he'll give you hope in the midst of it. Maybe for some of you, you just want a few moments in prayer asking the Spirit, open my eyes. Christmas is so busy. Stuff on the calendar, we just brush through it, get through it. Open my eyes to see the places of hope that are all around us. However you need to respond, I pray that you would do so because... Um, if God is moving, there's nothing more important than responding to what he's doing. Uh, let's pray. I'll be available to pray with you. Father, we thank you that you are not a God who is far off. God, you are um, one who voluntarily entered into our weakness, our frailty, our suffering, with the intention of bringing redemption, of making all things new. And God, I know that those words are familiar for many in the room, and perhaps there are some, they just kind of ring hollow right now, and that's okay. But God, I pray by your Holy Spirit, there would be a renewed confidence in the hope that we have in Christ, a hope that changes everything, a hope that began with suffering, the suffering of Mary and Joseph as they sought a place to have their child and that ended with the suffering of the cross. God, we pray that you would give us confidence and assurance in whatever we're walking through now. Oh, we love you and we thank you for Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.